Would you ever kill someone? Well, hopefully you're very confident that the answer is no. Though it may be apt to remind you guys that murder is not all that uncommon. We hear about serial killers in the media all the time, and in the United States of America, more than 17,000 people are murdered each and every year. But what makes some people more predisposed to kill? Perhaps alternatively I should ask, why you feel so confident that you would never ever take someone else's life. The core question is this, are some people's brains hardwired through an unfortunate combination of nature and nurture to be more violent, more impulsive, and lacking in empathy, thus making them more likely to be murderers? This is definitely a thorny topic that's clouded by plenty of media sensationalism and a lot of strong heartfelt opinions, for good reason, that I will not go into or try to explain. But what I do plan to explain are the neuroanatomical differences that exist between the brains of murderers and those that have not killed anyone, and what the implications of these findings are. My name is Hashem and I'm a University of Cambridge graduate and student doctor and this is everyone's favourite medical channel, Doctor Tell Me Why. And today on Doctor Tell Me Why I will be summarising the research for you, mostly looking at brain imaging studies because I know your favourite thing in the world is looking at brain scans like MRIs and PET scans. We will be comparing the brains of convicted murderers with the brains of other violent non-homicidal offenders, looking for structural differences and differences in energy metabolism. And then I'll move on to the differences that exist between different kinds of murderers and what the implications of these findings are. Moving on next to explain what the theory of mind tells us about emotions and specifically empathy, and why empathy is so 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 important to stopping you from killing other people, no matter how tempting it may actually be. I'll then finish off by mentioning some ongoing studies that should yield some really interesting results in the future. As always, you should find links in the description below to all the different scientific studies that I used to put this video together. In the description you should also find chapters that should help you navigate to the different parts of the video. So feel free to jump around to the parts of the video that interest you the most. But if you find yourself enjoying my company for one reason or another, then I think what's best for both you and me would be for you to subscribe to the channel. I make videos about cool things in medicine, so if that's your cup of tea, then definitely subscribe. Don't forget to smash the like button and let's get started. Bum bum bum. So a recently published paper in the scientific journal Brain Imaging and Behaviour reveals structural differences in grey matter in the brains of convicted murderers detected by MRI scans. What makes this study special is its relatively large size, including over 800 incarcerated men in eight prisons in two American states, Wisconsin and New Mexico. This is also the first study to control for factors like psychosis, excluding people with a history of traumatic brain injury and psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia. And the findings of this study were truly remarkable. Convicted murderers were significantly more likely to show reduced grey matter volume in large areas of the prefrontal cortex, the insula, cerebellum, cingulate, and parietal cortex, and the precuneus. These differences were not differences that existed between these homicide offenders and the average man, but these were differences that existed between these homicide offenders and other non-homicidal offenders who had committed violent crimes. Think things like armed robberies, domestic violence, arson and kidnapping. Basically these MRI findings showed that even within those who were criminally violent, there were still substantial differences in brain structure between those who were capable of killing someone, of murder, and those who were not. Hence, making us doubt the idea that violence equals or even is a prerequisite for murder. It's not. The differences between these two groups were grey matter volume differences. And grey matter is essentially where neuron, dendrites and soma are located. Essentially this is the part of the brain where information is processed and where neurons can communicate with each other. Jean Desseti, really hope I'm pronouncing his name okay, professor of psychology and psychiatry at the University of Chicago tells us 
that more grey matter means more cells, neurons and glia. And hence having reduced grey matter could mean reduced computational capacity in the areas of the brain that we mentioned previously. Areas of the brain that just happen to be vital in the processing of emotions, feeling empathy for others and in the control of impulsive behaviours. It's easy to see how deficits in processing emotions, empathy and in self-control could make someone more predisposed to taking someone else's life. Think of it as being an old computer with limited processing power like 512 megabytes or something and not being able to fully empathize with others nor fully comprehend the consequences of your actions because of these computational limitations. You can only handle so much information at any given point. And this appears to largely agree with earlier published work examining the brains of convicted murderers using PET scans. These early studies revealed acutely reduced glucose metabolism in the prefrontal cortex and asymmetrical activity in the amygdala thalamus and hippocampus in the brains of convicted murderers. Damage to the prefrontal cortex has been linked to risk-taking behavior, loss of self-control, poor social judgment, outbursts of aggression and violence. Meanwhile, the amygdala, hippocampus and the thalamus play a vital role in governing our emotions and behavior. And when those two groups of brain structures are disrupted at the same time, well that could be a recipe for disaster. Think of someone who is impulsive, doesn't fully comprehend the consequences of their actions and struggles to control their emotions and empathize with others. Should I give you any more hints? He's a bad, bad guy. But you know what I like about this? Number one, I'm in love and you're in love. We're all in love together. But of course, not all murderers are the same. One commonly used way to categorize murderers is to group them as either affective, meaning impulsive and emotional, or predatory, meaning planned and premeditated. And scientists were able to identify further differences between these two groups. The affective murderers were significantly more likely to show dysfunction in their prefrontal cortex which was responsible for regulating behavior, aggressive impulses and executive planning. Meanwhile, the predatory or the premeditated group had more or less good function in their prefrontal cortex. But what both groups appeared to have in common was impaired function in their subcortical brain structures which include the amygdala, hippocampus, thalamus, and the hypothalamus. Some scientists speculate that while both groups have a tendency towards anger, emotional volatility, and aggression, making them more likely to kill, the affective or the emotional killer is unable to control their behavior and so ends up killing in the spur of the moment, while the premeditated killer can control their behavior long enough to plan their victim's murder. Essentially, the core issue doesn't appear to be poor behavior your control and a tendency towards violence, but rather the core issue appears to be emotional dysfunction. And the way that this emotional dysfunction is expressed, essentially what type of murderer the person becomes, depends largely on the integrity of other brain structures like the prefrontal cortex. So let's talk about emotional dysfunction a bit more and specifically empathy and how it relates to the theory of mind. What is empathy? I like to think of empathy as the brain's magical ability to understand and share the feelings of others and empathetic people are less likely to become murderers. Facts. Why? Because an empathetic person is a person who is more likely to understand why the person they're spending time with feels or behaves in a certain way. Perhaps why they are angry with them and is thus less likely to respond to that anger with violence, aggression or even murder. An empathetic person is also someone who is more likely to see other people's feelings and emotions as being real, which really helps to humanize other people and allows you to see their lives as being equal to yours. And it also allows you to handle rejection from a romantic partner in a better way and paves the way for self-reflection, because it is only through empathy that you can start to see yourself through the eyes of others. Empathy is of course something that we develop in infancy and early childhood as part of the theory of mind and it allows us to understand that other people may have unique beliefs and desires that can be very different from our own. One key precursor to developing the theory of mind is imitating other people like when children pretend to be doctors playing with their little plastic stethoscopes. True theory of mind emerges around ages 
4 to 5 and so it is hypothesized that any issues in child rearing that happened before then, like neglectful parents for example, could have a detrimental impact on the child's emotional development and their capacity for empathy. Of course it's likely that other factors may be at play too like genetic tendencies but I think that this may be outside the scope of this video. Who knows? Maybe I'll end up discussing it in a later video, but the only way for you to know is for you to subscribe to the channel for more content just like this. And leave recommendations in the comments below if you have any ideas or suggestions for videos you would like me to do in the future. I read all the suggestions, so that's good. So maybe you may have noticed that the vast majority of the research tends to focus on male homicide or offenders and there is a very good reason for this. Men are significantly more likely to kill than women are. Still I think it would be interesting to look at female uh, homicide offenders and compare their brains to male homicide offenders to see if there are any structural differences that exist between the two groups. It could perhaps tell us about whether men and women kill for the same reasons. Currently there is one large ongoing study of a sample of ultra high risk boys. The boys are no longer boys, they're now in their mid 20s. But basically the study hopes to determine if specific brain regions could be used to predict future homicidal behavior, whether someone goes on to kill someone, another person or not. This is obviously really contentious, with many people worrying that brain scans may be used in the not so distant future to incarcerate individuals with these neuroanatomical anomalies before they've even committed any crimes. To protect and safeguard the interests of broader society, which is obviously really reprehensible. And I'm honestly not sure if such a crazy idea will ever get implemented, but what I do know is that if it does get implemented, it will be implemented in China before any other country. Just an idea, just a thought, just a prediction. Hope you guys liked that. Please don't forget to smash the like button and subscribe to the channel if you happen to be new here. Also, tell me what you guys thought of this video in the comments below and see you all very soon, but definitely not next week. <laughs>